Live from Vancouver, Canada, it's theCUBE at OpenStack Summit Vancouver 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsors EMC and jointly by Red Hat and Cisco. With additional sponsorship by Brocade and HP. And now your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Okay, welcome back everyone to theCUBE. This is the OpenStack Summit live coverage here in Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, we are here live, bringing all the data and sharing that with you. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my co-host, Stu Miniman, the analyst at wikibon.com. Our next guest is Mark Shuttleworth, founder of Ubuntu. Welcome back to theCUBE, great to see you. Great to be here. We said the March Madness, you got dropped out early, but we'll next year we'll get you. Uh, <laughs> great to have you on. You're I a celebrity in the industry. You've been on before, you've been in space. The container stuff's crazy, cloud's crazy, OpenStack's crazy, open source. What are some of the things you guys are talking about today? Because the conversations have been across the board. Yeah. Big engineering discussions, people deploying. What's, yeah. your, what's your take on all this? Well, I think the outstanding shift that we've seen is, this, uh, is, is uh, the user presence at the summit, right? It has been a vendor, 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 vendor kind of event. And uh, I'd say there's at least 40% users here which is, which is great, great for two reasons. First, it, 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 it gives meaning to all the work, and second, it, it helps shape what the platform actually ends up doing, right? Uh, yeah, and you get the real data because the yeah. users will tell you what's important to them, yeah. <laughs> not just vendors, kind of what Dave Vellante calls the urinary Olympics, right. um, talking about their speeds and feeds, now it's the rubber hitting the road. Yes. You get the users saying, and what are the conversations are those users having? What do they want? What's the language? So I think the key issues now are uh, deployment and operations, and operations are the more uh, interesting part of that, right? Right? So you can stand up a cloud, how do you grow it, how do you scale it, how does it deal with errors, failure, um, what's the operating model behind that, what kind of choice do you have in, in all of the different components you can, uh, you can integrate into that uh, cloud, how expensive is it, those are all critical conversations and they're happening this time. Yeah. So, so Mark, you know, when, when Canonical was founded, one, one of the things it tried to help do was bring Linux to you know, really more non-technical people. Yeah. So how are you extending that into the OpenStack community? So our vision is that you can point our OpenStack distribution at a cluster of hardware of arbitrary size, you know, 10 machines, 10,000 machines, and it will, uh, uh, it will build the cloud that you ask for. So you can choose your software-defined software network. Uh, Juniper, um, uh, Midacura, PlumGrid, Nuage, uh, Cisco are all bringing their software-defined network plugins effectively to our OpenStack installer. Uh, you can choose your software-defined storage and uh, Swift and Ceft are there obviously, but we announced this week uh, Next Center and Swift Stack. Uh, there are more in the pipe and the idea is to give users the choice of all of the best of breed components. Uh, but without ha them having to shoulder the burden of then, uh, you know, building the architecture, actually deploying the cloud, uh, operating the cloud, all of that's automated. Yeah, um, so, so talk a little bit about uh, LexD, you know. So, LexD. Uh, you know, it was big kind of buzz, one of the things. I said there wasn't a lot of drama this week, but I, I did, did see some splashy headlines sure. about war and what you're doing. Uh, help educate us a little on that. Sure, so LexD is the continuation of LexC. Yeah. If we take LexC, which has been the fundamental underpinning of all of the open container work in Linux over the last couple of years. Uh, that work is largely led by Canonical. It was started by IBM. Most of those guys now are at Canonical. Uh, we, all of the core contributors effectively to LexC. It's now become LexD because it's grown a daemon, and that's because we can do live migration of containers, which is incredible. So LexD is a hypervisor. It gives you essentially container machines, and in those machines you have CentOS or Debian or Ubuntu or RHEL in one and a half seconds uh, with no virtual machine overhead. So that's very, very cool. Yes, yeah, so, so tell me, I mean, is this like vMotion was for, for VMware? It sounds a little similar, but probably different. That's, I exactly, mean. that's okay. exactly right. right. So LexD is a hypervisor that uses containers. And uh, we're working with the silicon manufacturers to, to give you silicon guarantees of isolation between those containers so that it's completely secure, even if there's a bug in the kernel. Um, the, uh, the, the critical thing there is massive density improvements because if you've got the same Tomcat process in 50 containers, uh, those are all sitting on the same kernel. So we can actually dedupe those perfectly. So we've got 14 times the density of full operating systems. In 16 gig of RAM, we could launch 500 guests on one little server. So incredible density, but I think the more important parts are bare metal performance. So instead of 
trying to use Ironic to get a, a physical machine through the Nova API, which is kind of trying to pretend that a donkey is a unicorn, right? <laughs> um, just put a single bare metal <laughs> container on that machine, give it the whole machine effectively, but because it's a container, we can live migrate it to another machine. We can uh, attach virtual networks and virtual disks to it. So it's a much more elegant approach to bare metal performance. Okay. And, then, and then lastly, yeah. you get um, all of the clarity of scheduling control and latency control in the container that you would get just for processes on the host. So we measured a, a, a greater than, a more than 100% improvement in the latency of things like messaging or, or, or other applications. Okay, so, you know, we, last year we talked a lot about Docker. Yep. Rocket has come out since yep. then. Intel made some announcements about uh, optimizations that they're yeah, yeah. doing. So uh, is LexD ah, so competitive let me to all those, or how does that, well, that, that fit together? So let me explain how it yeah. works. Like, LexD is a hypervisor, yeah. right? So if you say, LexD, give me CentOS, okay. you get CentOS. In there, you've got Upstart on, on, on CentOS 6 or SystemD, you've got SSH, you've got TTYs, et cetera, et cetera. It's a hypervisor, right? That's a machine. And in that, you can say, Docker, run my database. And so you can run Docker, which is really a process container, right? inside LexD, and we've worked very closely with the Docker guys, they love the idea, it's completely orthogonal, they don't compete. Okay, so it, it's more of taking, you know, KVM, it's you know. Exactly, oh. so awesome. hence the teasing headline, just to be clear, yeah, yeah. there's tons of KVM on Ubuntu, we love KVM on Ubuntu, those two will sit right next to each other in the cloud, so you have one cloud, KVM and LexD, and for some applications, you want a container, for some you want a VM. You can't run Windows in a container, so you'd use KVM for something like that. Yeah. So um, what does this mean for customers? I mean, we talk about performance. What's the impact of the customers when they have this kind of agility and performance? Say you're a bank and you're building out an OpenStack cluster, and in that you're going to run a whole bunch of PHP and Tomcat VMs. It's all your idle sort of web workloads, right? If you, if you make that Lex, a LexD OpenStack, you'll get something like 10 to 14 times the density. That means you need a 10th to a 14th of the hardware, right? Just to host all of those idle VMs. Um, that's a pretty incredible saving for that bank, right? And operationally, it's no different. You're getting machines, right? You've got, you've got CentOS, you've got Debian, you've got Ubuntu, you've yeah. got RHEL, as you, as you like it. Mm. Stu brought up the simplicity thing, and this is a huge thing coming out of this, this event here, is that you're starting to see the deployments, you're starting to see the innovations that you guys are, are doing. This is all the evolution. The simplicity equation, the management, these are big issues now. Now right, it's the it's hard the, issues. It's the operations of This is the operational right. engineering. So there's not just software engineering and right. coolness involved in that, developers, et cetera. But when you start getting down to the operational architecture, what are your, what's your vision on the simplicity, how to make it easier on the management side, deploying, so we talk about below the line and above the line, right? Above the line, it should look just like a public cloud, right? In other words, Google, Amazon, Azure, you say, I want a VM, you get a VM, right? And it should just work. Um, and one of the cool things we've done for the above the line use case, is we've now said we'll price support for the cloud based on VM hours. So you can, you can exactly compare both operationally and from an economic point of view, the cost to you of uh, the above the line piece, right? Below the line, it's total automation. So a management tool, you point it at that cluster, you tell it which SDN, which software-defined storage, you tell it how many machines to use in the cluster, and it builds the cloud. But it doesn't just build it, it then operates it. So if MySQL has a problem and one of the three HA replica sets effectively of, uh, of MySQL dies, the management tool creates another one and you might get an email, right? So it's, it's all on the fly, all completely automated, all completely managed, and and uh, essentially zero cost to the to the operator of the cloud. That's the only way we can <coughs> we can make the claim that if you've got a cluster of a hundred machines and you've got a, a hundred apps on those machines, <coughs> and you want to insert OpenStack underneath and run the same apps on the same cluster, OpenStack can't add any cost, right? Otherwise, we've we've gone backwards. Yeah, right. that's yeah. You don't want to increase. <coughs> you want to increase exactly. more leverage. That's exactly. the whole purpose of the cloud, right? right? All right. So, give me an example of some benchmarks. This, I love this line concept. Above the line, below the line. Have you guys got any data on just some benchmarking? Just some generic, like old way, new way, order of magnitude differences, cost, performance. Sure, actually I think uh, uh, Gartner did some numbers on uh, the cost of OpenStack. We think that's really important because it's starting to shift the conversation from the technology to the economics and the operations, and the operations are a big part of the cost. Um, we, we have announced that we will fully manage to an SLA um, your cloud for five cents per VM hour. 
So what's that us? That's, that's us saying that we reckon all of the salary costs, all of the costs of you know, looking at that cloud, monitoring it, managing it, and so on, we can do all of that for five cents an hour. And really it's a statement that if you use our tools, you can do it for even less than that, right? So it's a very profound statement about the overall economics of OpenStack. Yeah, so Mark, uh, my understanding you guys have been involved in some of the OCP stuff mm. and you're doing things, some cool things with service providers. Can, can you bring us up to speed on those pieces? Yeah, I think, I think o OCP is turning into a great forum to connect the mega operator thinking to traditional IT, right? Um, and uh, the, the, the most recent summit in San Jose was outstanding and, and very, very well attended. Um, but more importantly, um, uh, increasingly enterprises are saying to me that they just want to buy hardware by the rack, they want to rack it and stack it, they want to turn it on and then have it be running OpenStack in 15 minutes. So a lot of our thinking is shaped by that vision and, op uh, and OCP really complements that because it's defining those racks. What's the future of OpenStack? I mean, you see, I mean, it, you said the vendors aren't just pissing on each other now because it's got some community balance. More importantly, people are differentiating, right? At the same time, the users are here. Everyone's talking, they're all connected, so you got a pretty decent community right now. It's, it feels equilibrium yeah. kind of set, set its pace. People got their swim lanes, whatever analogy people want to use. Differentiation now becomes a big thing. Now right. it's proof to value, right. right? So what do you see in that regard? Value creation, differentiation. If you're a vendor, you got to differentiate and then provide value. That's the flywheel of the new business model. What's your outlook on the community? Well, I, th I think our view is that if that below the line, if that cloud essentially was completely automa automatically built um, and completely automatically managed, that means it also can evolve, right, automatically. It can grow. It can grow new kinds of um, storage. It can grow new kinds of, uh, of hypervisor. And um, doing that means that all of this innovation can essentially be surfaced to users without them having to become experts in any of it, right? So behind Cinder, we can do incredible things with storage. Behind Neutron, we can do incredible things with networks. Behind um, uh, Nova, we can do incredible things with hypervisors. And to the user, we're getting to the point now where they can actually just enjoy that flow of goodness, right? They yeah. don't have to be kind of wrestling under, yeah. under the hood. It's like web services realized. I mean, right. that's service-oriented architecture in a way back right. on the table with cloud leverage. Right. I uh, think the, the, the heart of our strength in OpenStack has been that we've always taken the view that OpenStack is a service-oriented architecture and we should model it, which we do with Juju, we should just model it as what it is. Yeah. And that makes it really easy to build, compose, stretch, scale, and that's the linguistics that customers talk in. They yeah. don't talk in, I need some Cloud Foundry. They talk, I need services. I need to right. plug this to that, wire stuff together, right. and make stuff work. For sure. Whatever's available. For sure. Yeah. So All right, so I got it. We'll hold up. So one yeah. question, one question. So, so we had VCs on earlier, so I got to get your, your industry take, given your legend in the industry and experience and run a comp big company as part of the, 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 the future. If you're an investor, how the hell do you make sense of OpenStack? I mean, got Gartner saying, oh, science projects, and the VCs are confused. Certainly they're not investing in the AWS ecosystem, a little bit different <laughs> dynamic, we one VC say, I, I can't do business in there at Amazon. Right. But in OpenStack, you know, well, well a contrarian view, but he's doing work in there at Storm Ventures, that's Ryan Floyd. But, but if you're a VC, how do you look at emerging opportunities, startups, what's the growth areas? What do you bet on? How do you make those bets? Well, I, I, I heard a great description of things uh, the other day where someone said, uh, you know, wh what, what startups do on the public cloud is kind of advertising, and what they do in private is where they make money. And so I think OpenStack is super important in that equation because um, um, to a bank, to a media company essentially, their OpenStack is their internal expression of the, of the stuff they would do in dev test on the public cloud perhaps, right? So that's where the money is. Um, we're delighted that the majority of those continue to be on Ubuntu. It doesn't matter if they're in telco, banking, media, right? And I would agree that if you're a startup, you want to make sure that you can do stuff on the public cloud because that's where people can quickly consume it, but you also want to be able to deliver that goodness on OpenStack. For us, Charming, Juju, is a great way for those guys to encapsulate this stuff so that it can go onto all the public clouds and onto OpenStack. Um, so it's a great way for startups to essentially hit both of those markets. Um, in terms of making money on OpenStack itself, we saw um, a, a, a reluctance for, from the VC community to continue underwriting you know, the OpenStack distributions, and Nebula wasn't able to raise another round. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really good. I think it's a signal that we would say that the winners and losers are already set, right? And I think it's pretty clear to us uh, that that's the case. 
Uh, I'm, I, yeah, I, first I, leg of the journey is pretty much set. Now right. there's a whole nother theater that's going on right. around value creation. But that's it, what you're getting at. But again, if you think um, if you think of what's happening below the line, um, because we've now pushed stuff behind Cinder Neutron Nova, there's still huge opportunity to innovate in storage, huge opportunity to innovate in the hypervisor, in the network, and so on. And those guys will attract money because now they can very quickly do a proof of concept in, say, a, a financial institution that's comfortable with OpenStack, spinning up a new cluster with their stuff in it and letting their developers throw workloads at it and see if it, if it makes a difference. If it makes a difference, they'll sell their stuff. Um, so I would be, as a VC, I'd be looking at guys who have really interesting ideas in storage, really interesting ideas in networking in particular. Um, I think there's no, I think the distributions, the, the winners and losers are set. And for, uh, certainly from a momentum point of view, Ubuntu's uh, in a good position. Yeah, so, so, so Mark, we, we've had a lot of conversations this week about you know, business models for creating value and money hmm. with open source, because it's tough to do. It is. You speak to you know, your company, you, you've got kind of a cloud division, you know, is it profitable? Right, uh, our cloud division very much is, um, uh, but that's in a sense the easy one, right? The, the models there are established. What we, what we have done is we've been quite disruptive in that by saying first the platform itself is free, everyone can use it that way. And what we announced this week that was really interesting was for the first time we're actually um, uh, describing service contracts that are focused on a whole service across many machines rather than supporting the machines. So for example, if you've got um, uh, Swift, we will work with Swift Stack or work directly to offer either the Swift Stack service or vanilla Swift effectively at your option. And we'll price that at the, um, uh, based on the service. It doesn't matter if that's on five machines or on 50 machines, we'll just measure the amount of usable data. So that's Amazon style pricing uh, in your private cloud. If you, if you set up a thousand machines and you write one file, you'll pay us support for that thousand machines, three cents, right, per month. Um, uh, and that's a really important kind of shift. But the other really nice thing that I think we're leading in that is that because we can now say that revenue is associated with Swift, we can take a share of that and send it back to the Swift community, right? So by aligning support for open source with the actual services, right, we can now really support the innovation that makes Ubuntu possible, right, by sending a check back to the upstream community. Uh, and that, I think, is a, is a really significant shift, and I hope, it, I, I hope it gets picked up, because the upstream communities can now uh, see ways to participate in, 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 in the platform. Yeah, so you, you said the winners are set. And of course, Canonical partners with a lot of companies. So you, you look at the storage, networking, you know, partners out there, you know, who are the important ones uh, for, for you guys to work ah, with? So just to be clear, I think the distribution okay. winners are set. And then inside that, of course, a, a big part of our story is we don't just offer one storage, right? We offer a marketplace and you can get storage from EMC, from ne uh, Next Center, from Swift Stack, from Swift, uh, from Ceph. Uh, uh, we'd like to offer Red Hat storage inside our product, right? So it's, it's the customer's choice of best of breed. So, so the, the winners and losers at the level of storage and networking, those are, that's still an open game. And I think some winners haven't even been born yet, right? There's a lot of innovation still to come. It's at the distribution level, right? I think that's going to be Ubuntu, Red Hat, VMware. Um, those are the key players. They have platforms. OpenStack is essentially a, an expression of the platform. Mark, thanks for coming on theCUBE. I really appreciate the time. I know we had to, you had a lot of meetings. I know you're super busy um, the, running the company. But pound the flash, pound yeah. the pavement he, here. He's been behind us. I mean, when, every time we, we, we see the shot of the guest, you know, there's some Ubuntu branding right behind there. Yeah, we, so. got, we got great product placement. We'll take a VIG later on that. But no, sir, in all seriousness, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. I'll give you the final word uh, uh, for the segment, which is what's next for you guys? What's on the horizon uh, for the company? What are some of the th personal goals that you have and would like to see happen for the company? Well, at, a, at a personal level, my personal goal is the next time you run this sort of deathmatch thing, you know, Erica, I'm coming for Cute you. Cute madness. <laughs> <laughs> Good, we have a bunch here. Now, don't let us down this year. Mark Shuttleworth, the founder of his own company, Ubuntu. Great, great guest, superstar in the industry, very technical, very knowledgeable, crazy good, as they say, uh, in the industry. Thanks for coming on, appreciate it. This is theCUBE, thanks for watching. We'll be right back after this short break. It's a pleasure, thanks. For